Well, this will be the last one. You will never live another Sunday in 2020 unless you discover time traveling. And that may be a wonderful thing. It may not be. Um, let, let me ask you this, because most of our world pretty much agrees, right, that 2020 was a, a rough year for most people. Would you, would you agree? How was it for your soul? Because that might be a different question, right? Uh, a, a year can be difficult for you physically. A year can be difficult for you materially. A year can be difficult in a lot of ways, but how was it for your soul? Oh, by the way, kids head out the back. There they go. With an adult, though. All right. Parents flipping their heads backwards. What's happening? 2020 can be difficult. It, it, it could be difficult that uh, an experience for you physically it could be a difficult experience for you monetarily. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a difficult experience for you spiritually. It really depends on what we're doing with it. Now, in ending the year this year and beginning our new year, what I would like to do is I'd like to just quickly recap where we've been this past year. That sounds terrifying, doesn't it? It's not going to be that long. I just want to remind you of what we've done so far this year. And you'll notice if you've got your um, outlines for today, grab one of these in the back. Uh, we don't have the normal questions on the back, the discussion questions. Instead, what I've done is I've listed out all the scriptures we were to memorize this past year. So you can post that somewhere uh, and refresh yourself on the scriptures over and over again. If you didn't get one, there's a bunch in the back there. You can probably raise your hand, and Greg will hand you some. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, no, he coughed. You're not allowed to do that in 2020. Uh, we began our, back in June, when I first came on here, we began by looking at the Great Commission. The sermon series we did, we called The Greatest Commission. We looked at Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. This, remember, was Jesus' prime directive to us as, his, as believers, as his disciples. And if you'll remember, we memorized that text, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to, or baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right? Uh, and we talked about Jesus being an absolute authority, that Jesus is the authority above all authorities, that God has given him absolute authority so that he can tell us what to do and instruct us, and we have to listen and abide by what he says. We talked about our mandatory mission, which is to make disciples. If you are a Christ follower, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, a learner of his, and your mission in this life is to make disciples. And we do that by instructing people. One of the instructions is a divine death, baptism. And remember, we went through what the scripture says about baptism. We talked about obligatory obedience. That when Jesus sets out this paradigm for us and says, live this way, we are to obey everything he commands of us and then teach others to obey all that he commands. We talked about the, the fact that Jesus didn't just leave us in that condition, but he promised to accompany us throughout the course of this life, that he is our peerless partner. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is always with us. We then, in August, moved on to a, a series I called Feeding, which is where we looked at spiritual nourishment that we take in. So we talked about feeding from Scripture. How is it that we invest ourselves in Scripture and learn from that? We talked about engaging the mind life. How do I make my mind a servant of Jesus Christ? And we talked about emotions and feeding emotions. And we discussed how emotions are not to be dominating how we think and behave, but rather emotions can be good and are good so long as they're subject to the facts of God. If our emotions follow in obedience to what he has set forth. And we talked about feeding with words, how we use our words to, em to embellish and build up the church. In that month, we memorized Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. Your words were found, and I ate them, and they became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts or armies, right? That's the same term in the original text. In September, we then jumped into a series on Christian apologetics. And remember, apologetics are a defense of the faith, reasons to believe that the faith is true. And so we got kind of deep in the weeds on that. We looked at all sorts of venues, philosophy, sociology, history, uh, the sciences, in order to establish evidences for the existence of God and the truth of his church. We memorized two passages during that time span, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, which says, Sanctify or set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be prepared to offer a 
defense to everybody who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do this with gentleness and respect. Okay, uh, the second passage we memorized, you might be thinking, I don't remember memorizing this one. That's because COVID hit us halfway through that month, and we stopped meeting for a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely uh, powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thought that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. Um, in that month, we discussed, or during those months, we discussed why something rather than nothing at all. Why is it that anything exists? We discussed the nature of truth, what truth is, and why truth is foundational for the Christian. We discussed cosmology, not cosmetology. We weren't talking about fingernails. Cosmology, uh, evidences for God that come from the origin of this universe. Then we talked about teleology, evidences from God from the complexity of this universe. Then we discussed axiology, evidences from God from morality and the existence of morality. Then we looked at archaeology, evidences for the Christian faith and the truth of the scriptures through the archaeological record. That was a lot, wasn't it? Then we took our COVID hiatus for a couple weeks there. Um, and then we came back and we began discussing divine community. We looked at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. This should still be relatively fresh for most of you. Um, that passage said, let us consider how to encourage one another in love and good deeds, not forsaking the gathering together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as the day draws near. All right. We talked about the, being a community of fellowship, what the church is, what the church isn't, that we are a kingdom meant to gather. We talked about being a community of order, that the church is, has these authority structures and their servant leadership structures. We talked about being a community of practices, uh, communion, baptism, the dedication and devotion to the apostles' teaching. We talked about being a community of worship, about being a community of prayer, about being a community of confession, about being a community of encouragement and correction. Does this feel like drinking from the fire hose yet? It's a whole lot, isn't it? We've really been a lot of places during the course of this year. Last week as we gathered, we talked about Christmas and looked at uh, the God who comes. Now, I'm reminding you of all these things for this reason. I think it's tragic when we go through a year and we take in a whole lot of sermons and we go, what did we study? And everybody's like, I don't know, but I think it was pretty good. <laughs> and we've all been there, right? I mean, even week to week, sometimes we're there. So let's, uh, let's not depend on our own ability here. What I'd like to do as we open today is I wanted to refresh you of what we just, what we just discussed. And then I want to make an appeal to God. So can we together pray to the Lord today about what we studied this year? Let's pray. Lord God, this is your kingdom, and we are your people. And God, we confess that we are weak of mind, that sometimes we're weak of, of, uh, of discipline, and sometimes we, we fail to take in the lessons and the things that you teach us. So God, right now, we're asking that your Holy Spirit would take everything that we've studied during the course of this year, take everything that, uh, that we've gone through, and Lord, that your Holy Spirit would sear into our hearts and minds the things we need to retain. Lord, you know that there are matters that can change your kingdom. So we're asking that those will become a permanent part of us. Now, Lord, we give this to you, and we say that we are your people. We are your disciples. Lead us. Direct us. Good shepherd. It's in your most precious name we pray. Amen. Today, we are bridging from the basics of this past year. And remember, we, this series this past year was the Christian basics. Not that they were simple, but that they were fundamental. We're bridging from that to a new series called Behold the Man. This series is going to span all of 2021. We're going to spend an entire year looking at the person of Christ, different aspects of his life, his teachings, and what he has done. Is this going to be on the test? Have you ever heard anyone ask that question in a classroom? Isn't that awkward? Like, I just kind of cringe inwardly whenever I, I hear somebody say something like that, because what's being communicated there? What are they saying? Yeah, this doesn't matter. What you're saying doesn't matter. It only matters to me insofar as it helps me get the grade. It only matters to me insofar as it helps me get a pass so I can get out of this place. I don't want to listen to you anymore. That's ugly when you experience it in the classroom. That should make you a little uncomfortable and feel a little awkward. But man, it's so much uglier in the kingdom of God. Think about how many times people approach Jesus and they seem to be asking sort of that question, right? 
What's the basics? What do I need to just get in? And what's being asked here, and let me be clear about this, is minimal entry requirements. What is the least I have to do to be saved? Aren't you glad that God did not give us that line, that cutoff? Think about how most of us would live if he said, this is where I will no longer accept you. We would be as close to that line as we could be, right? And, and so God leaves that empty there so that we, he, he doesn't say, this is how far you can go and then you're done. But he tells us what we ought to be doing so we stay well on that side. Are you that kind of student? Do you ask what's on the test? Are you looking for minimal entry requirements into the kingdom of God? Do you know, want to know what's the least you have to do and still be saved? Now, most of us would never say that out loud. But let's be honest, a good portion of the church operates that way. There's another kind of student, though. The student that drinks in information, that just loves to learn. Uh, I would have stayed in college forever if my wife had not made me graduate. Probably debt would have made me graduate at some stage of the game as well. But I, I just, I love being in classrooms. I love, I love hearing and learning and taking more and more in. I could have done that for the rest of my life and been very happy, you know, apart from the fact that I wouldn't earn a living. But the, the thing is, is there, there's a type of student who likes to just learn. People would ask me what I was majoring in or what I was going into, and I was like, I don't know. But, but I like to learn. I like to take it in. I like, I like to hear. And I think about Mary and Martha in this regard. Do you remember the story of Mary and Martha with Jesus in Luke chapter 10? It's in verse 38 of Luke chapter 10. Jesus is teaching. And in this day and age, women were expected to sort of take care of the, the household needs to a degree that like men were just left to talk and do the important things, right? And so Mary and Martha are entertaining this crowd of Jesus' disciples and Martha is bustling around trying to get food, and she's trying to get drinks ready, and she's trying to do all the things that were sort of culturally, culturally expected of her. But where's Mary? At Jesus' feet. She's sitting at the feet of Christ, and she's listening. And Martha is getting more and more bothered. She's like, okay, Mary, come on, come on, Mary. And so she finally goes to Jesus in exasperation and says, will you tell my sister to get in here and help me out? Jesus' response to her is precious. It's beautiful. He's like, I'm not going to take away the good thing from her. Mary is doing the right thing. What she's doing is the better thing. In other words, what's better than bustling around? What's better than taking care of your cultural expectations? Sitting at the feet of the master. So as we enter into 2021, what kind of student are you? What are you looking to accomplish this year? Is it minimal entry requirements? Are you going to try to skate by and get into heaven with as little as you possibly have to do? Or are you looking to sit at the feet of the master? I pray that it is the latter during the whole course of this year. Today we're going to be discussing uh, our series, Behold the Man. And this is sort of a setup for the year. But I, I'm, I'm really wanting us to ask this question as we enter into this. What am I hoping for? What am I going to strive to do this year? So we're going to ask the question, what are you looking for? What are you seeking? And secondly, we're going to ask, what are you seeing? And thirdly, we want to ask, do you know him? What are we looking for? Let's talk about seeking the Lord. You've all played hide and seek, right? You remember that game. Some of you are staring at me. You've all played hide and seek, right? Okay. It's like, does, that is not just a game that I made up, is it? Is that all in my head? One person counts, everyone else goes off to hide. Now imagine you're playing hide and seek, you know, maybe as an adult, maybe as a kid. You're playing hide and seek, and the seeker shouts, ready or not, here I come. Then moves two steps and picks up a plot potted cactus. Found you. Then takes another two steps and grabs the neighbor's cat. Meow. Found you. It takes another two steps and turns and gestures at a brick wall. Found you. Imagine playing that game without knowing what you're looking for. Or who you're looking for. It wouldn't be hide and seek so much as it would just be seek, right? You're just vaguely going out there and locating things. I find that many of us as Christians have this as sort of a spiritual principle of our lives. We're coming into the relationship with the Lord and we have no idea what we're looking for. There were many people who sought out Jesus. They pursued him, but they did not know what they wanted from him, what they were seeking. I think about Herod. Herod was looking for an experience. 
Herod, not, not Herod the Great, he sought to kill Jesus. Herod uh, Antipas, the guy who puts Jesus on trial. Did you know that he was looking for Jesus? He was trying to get an audience with Jesus as Jesus was moving around. So he would hear, hey, Jesus is in, uh, is, is in Bethsaida. And he would pack up his entourage, and they would march out to try to find Jesus. And when they got there, Jesus was gone, and he couldn't locate him. He wanted to see and hear from Jesus because he was looking for something. In Luke chapter 23, verse 8, he finally gets his audience with Jesus. It's when he's on trial, when Jesus is on trial for his life. And so Jesus is brought before Herod. Now, Herod had been looking for him. He wanted an experience. He wanted a show, let's be honest. Now, Herod was overjoyed when he saw Jesus, for he wanted to see him for a long time because he'd been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. Jesus shows up, and he's there in front of Herod, and Herod's asking him questions, but Jesus is not dancing to Herod's tune. Herod wants to see something great, and Jesus like a sheep before his shearers, remain silent. And so how does Herod respond? He becomes hostile. He lays into Jesus. He joins in the rebuke and the criticism, and this guy is not what I thought he is, and continues to lay into Jesus just as the Romans had been doing. Many of us engage with Jesus in the same way. We're waiting to be impressed. We want to see him dance to our tune. And when he shows up in our lives and he says something we weren't expecting or he doesn't speak to what we want him to speak to, we begin to resent him. There are a lot of people in our world like that. The crowds wanted to see Jesus, didn't they? Everywhere Jesus went, there were crowds of people who wanted to see him. The crowds were waiting to see a number of things. They wanted miracles, but they also really wanted conflict. Any of you old enough to remember the Jerry Springer show? People went to watch that show because of the drama. There were people losing their ever-loving minds in public in ways that were shameful and awful, and everybody wanted to see it. I think many of the crowd showed up to see Jesus for the same reason. Think about the types of things that Jesus said. I mean, he insulted the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He didn't care who you were. He would talk bad about Herod. He spoke in in teachings that were obscure and weird. He said bizarre things. It was a weird show. And so the crowds turned out. And we often think good things about the crowds. They like to be scandalized. They like to hear things that were outlandish. And they said things like, this is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? And uh, Hosanna to Messiah, to the son of David. And they're throwing palm branches on the road. And they're throwing blankets out before him as he comes into Jerusalem riding on the foal of a donkey. And it's the same crowd that later in the week would say, crucify him. Because the crowd is fickle. Because the crowd is interested in a show so long as they're getting exactly what they want. But as soon as it costs them something, they're willing to toss it away. And toss him away. There are others who are looking for Jesus, the broken who are looking for repairs. A lot of people who stop in a church are doing so for this reason. They come into a congregation of believers and they're coming for the same reasons that many went and sought Jesus in the first century. The lepers, they wanted to be healed. The ill, they wanted things made right again. The malformed, the blind, the deaf, the lamed. We often come to Jesus and we go, hey, Can you fix this life? i got a marriage that's not working right. I'm not feeling well. Um, Can you just make this better so I feel better, so we've got more money, so we've got more ability to do good things right now? I just want life to to go swimmingly. I want my kids to love me. I want my kids' kids to actually do well and not, not run off and be terrible people. And so these are the things that concern us most. I'm often astonished when I hear a Christian in the face of suffering experiencing difficulty, and they say something like, why do we even bother praying? I mean, if, if God's going to treat me like this, why do I even bother? Or something like, a lot of good serving God did me. Look at my circumstance. Look how bad this is. What do such people think we're doing here? What is the point of all this? Did they not hear Jesus? Have you, have you not heard his words? I mean, he spoke about these issues. He said, anybody who desires to live a godly life is going to be uh, persecuted. No student is greater than his master. You remember him saying these things. Count the cost before you come and follow me. In this world, you will have many troubles. These were promises of Jesus. Why did we think we would get out of it? 
because we are careful about how we look at Jesus. We only look at the things he did, and we think, well, this is what God must be about, healing lepers, making the blind see, restoring, restoring sight, helping the lame to walk. This is what Jesus is about. This is what God is about. He wants me to have my best life now. No. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but do you know what? He died again. The lepers who were healed, their skin was restored, but they were not preserved from illness for the rest of their days in this life. They would get sick again. The lame would age and die. The blind, if they lived old enough, would eventually lose their sight to old age again, right? Did Jesus make things perfect for everyone here and now? The answer to that is no. And did Jesus come to give us better lives? I think the answer to that is yes, but most of us as first, or 20th century, 21st century Americans would not recognize better by Jesus' standards. Look at what he says in the Sermon on the Mount. What does he hold to be happiness, blessedness? Is it the same thing you hold to be blessed or happy? Certainly not what our culture would hold to be blessed or happy. Open your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Many are seeking Jesus for an experience. We want to show, we want drama, we want repairs. It's an experience, and that's such a vague thing, because an experience can be good or bad. 2020 was an experience. But some people seek Jesus because they want something more. Some are seeking him because they want a master and Lord. We pray to God as Lord, and sometimes I think we forget what that means. How many times have you said Lord to God? Do you, do you think about what that means? If you call him master, what does that mean? It means you are over me. You are above me. You have control of my life. Is that what you sought when you sought Jesus Christ? Were you looking for a quick fix? Were you looking for a show? Were you looking for a good teacher? Were you looking for somebody who brought interesting ideas into your life? Or were you looking for someone who would control who you are and what you do? Let's look at Jesus' earliest followers. John chapter 1, let's look at verse 35. A bunch of people are following John the Baptist. In verse 35, we read about two of them. Again, the next day, John, that is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked along, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned around and saw them following him, and he said, What do you want? Close your eyes for a moment. I want you to percolate on that. You're following Jesus, and he turns around, and he looks at you. And he says, what do you want? What do you want? I think the disciples had a phenomenal answer. They might not have known it was phenomenal, but it is phenomenal. I think they were caught off guard, kind of like we'd probably be caught off guard. And they asked him, where are you staying? What a weird question. What do you want? Where are you staying? It's kind of like a stalker statement, isn't it? That's not actually what was transpiring there. When they turn and they ask him, where are you staying? What they're asking is essentially this, where are you going next? Where are you headed next? And Jesus responds to them, come and you will see. This is why I think this is a great response to Jesus. What do you want? Where are you going? What are you doing? Come along. Come see. That's the invitation that Jesus is going to be offering us during the course of this year. Come and see. Come and spend time with me and see. 2021 is going to be a year where we seek him. This year, we're going to be focusing every sermon on Jesus, on his life, his teachings, and his story. We're calling the series, Behold the Man. And it comes from the experience of Jesus as he is before Pilate. You remember, Pilate has him flogged and beaten. And if you've seen the Passion of the Christ, you get a sense of what that looks like. Somebody's back just lacerated and ripped open, clear down to the bone. And Jesus is beaten, and they twist together a crown of thorns, and they jam it onto his head so it's biting into his skin. And the scripture tells us in John chapter 19 that they just kept punching him in the face. And the, and the Greek is rendered here over and over and over again. In other words, he was just a mess in his face. And Pilate brings him out before the crowd to try to, to try to pacify the Jews who were calling for his blood. 
And he brings him out, and here is Jesus, broken and bloodied, with a robe around him, beaten in the face and with his crown of thorns. And the, the Latin is ecce homo, behold the man. Look, here he is. This is what we want to do this year. I want to look at Jesus in, with the unvarnished truth. I want to see him for who he is. Let's talk about that next. Let's talk about seeing him. So you might seek him for a number of reasons. I hope the reason we're seeking him this year is we want a master and Lord. We desire him to be rabbi, to be the, the all-present teacher. What do you see when you look at Jesus? Have you noticed that when people look at, people can look at the same thing and not see the same thing? Have you ever noticed that? I had uh, almost 20 years to do youth ministry, so I got to be good at observing human behavior. Let me, tell you, uh, let, me, let me tell you about something I found interesting. We would occasionally get a guy who came into the youth group, and he was kind of quiet. He was the quiet guy. And when the guy who is quiet comes into the youth group, moderately attractive and quiet, I found this happened over and over again. A number of girls in the youth group were suddenly swooning with desire for the quiet guy. And so I asked myself, why? Like, what is it about this person that makes him a draw? I mean, he's, he's not bubbly, he's not vivacious, he's not been overtly funny or interesting in that way. What is it about that guy that makes him a draw? And I think to some degree, it's the mystery. Like, who is he? Who is he really? I could be the person who finds out. But I think to a greater degree, it's this. He could be anything. And so oftentimes, people project what they want him to be onto him. They, they infer that he is this. He's this thing that I'm desiring. It's this kind of person that I'm looking at. And that's exactly what we do with Jesus over and over again. There's a difference. There's a difference between seeing someone as they are and seeing someone as, they, someone as you want them to be. The word behold means to look upon or gaze at. To look upon or gaze at. I'm staring intently, but it also means to hold up for observation. Look at this. And this is what Pilate's doing. He's going, is this what you expected? Is this what you're afraid of? Behold the man. And when you see Jesus in that condition, do you look at him and go, it's not what I expected. It's not what makes me comfortable. Oh, maybe on this side of the history it does. But for none of his followers were they looking at that going, victory. What they saw was a tragedy. Is your relationship with Christ a passive project or an active project? How many of us show up to church and just wait for the relationship to be programmed into us, sort of Matrix style? You ever seen the Matrix, right? They just they jack into a computer and I know Kung Fu. Wouldn't that be great if that's how your relationship with Christ worked? But it doesn't work that way. It is not a passive feature. It's not going to just happen to you. When we see someone, we either see them as they are or we project on them what we want them to be. And here's what I find. Many of us have not spent enough time with Jesus to know who he really is. Instead, we live with a projection. And for many Christians, it's a projection that was pieced together when, when you were in elementary school coming to church and getting a Sunday school impression of who Jesus is. When's the last time you looked at the life of Christ and went, man, that makes me uncomfortable? Wow, that really challenges me. I, I didn't think this is who he was. I didn't think this is who, how he acted. So many times people will try to compensate and make excuses for what Jesus is doing and saying rather than knowing him, rather than letting him change us. Who's made in whose image? You know that there are people out there who believe that Jesus was a vegan. That when it says in the scriptures that he ate fish, what it really means is he ate fish weed, a type of seaweed. There are people out there who believe that Jesus was a pot smoking advocate. I'm not kidding. It's a real thing. They're really out there. There are people who are out there who believe that Jesus was a social reformer and was trying to develop communism in his followers. There are people out there who believed many things. In Jesus' own day, this was happening. The zealots heard him and they went, this guy wants to overthrow Rome. Think about what it would mean to have a commander on our side who could heal people or raise people from the dead. We'd be an unstoppable army. The Pharisees listened to him and they went, I hope he agrees with my rabbi, and if he doesn't, he's out of here. 
or this guy could be a tool of ours to use to further our own control. Even in Jesus' day, people were listening to him to appropriate what he said and make him who he wanted them to be. And he disappointed everybody. Every time somebody showed up in his life and tried to force him into a category, he went, nope, I'm not going there. Or, well, sorry to disappoint you. They thought they had him pinned down when they brought him up to ask him about whose, whose picture was on the coin. Shall we pay taxes to Caesar? And he shot them all down and made them all feel stupid. He was awesome at that. He's still awesome at that. If we approach him as he really is. Whose responsibility is relationship? You've all heard the phrase, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Same is true of Christianity. You can lead a person to Christ, but you can't make him follow. There's a difference between sitting in church every week and being a disciple of Jesus Christ. We all know that, right? Do we understand that? Your relationship with Christ, to really see him, to really know him, requires continual actions and universal application. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 7. The Amplified Bible really gets this right. Most other Bibles, I find, do not have this, this passage well done. Matthew chapter 7, let's look at verse 7 and 8. Get a pen ready. If you don't have the Amplified, you might want to bolster your version here. There's something interesting happening. Here's what the Amplified renders. It gets the Greek right. Ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives, and he who keeps on seeking finds. And to him who keeps on knocking, it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will instead give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will instead give him a snake? If you then, sinful by nature as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, who is perfect, Give what is good and advantageous to those who keep on asking him. Did you notice a continual action? It's not a one-time thing. It's not a one-time asking. It's not a one-time seeking. It's not one-time knocking. Jesus gives the indication that God is revealed to us most powerfully as we pursue and pursue and pursue. So are you going to pursue him this year? Let's talk about how this is going to work. Let me tell you what we're going to do. I told you that we've got a sermon series that's going to be Jesus all year. But you're not going to get a lot out of that unless you are pursuing every day on your own. So here comes the big homework assignment. We got the basics out of the way. Here's your homework assignment this year. Every single day this year, every day, I want you to read one chapter in one of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Every day, one chapter. It'll take you five minutes if you're rolling through it quickly. You don't have to read just one chapter, but you read at least one chapter every day. You spend every day with Jesus. Every day. Do you think you'll be different by the end of the year? Do you think you will know him better? Do you think you will see him differently? That's not rhetorical. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, You might be going, well, that's difficult. I mean... It's a chapter, that's a lot of commitment, Ben. You'll, by the way, you'll have read the Gospels more than four times by the time we hit the end of the year. That's difficult. Really? How much time do you spend in the bathroom every day? How much time do you spend watching TV every day? How much time do you appropriate for sitting in front of the computer and looking at Facebook? How much time do you appropriate for watching sports? And let me just turn that around very quickly and ask you, how important is God to you? How important is your relationship to Jesus? Oh, it means everything to me, does it? Does your calendar reflect that? Five minutes a day, that's tough. Uh, I've had this situation over and over again in youth ministry where we'd come in and we were supposed to read a chapter during the week. And everybody would be like, I had so much homework this week. Really? Open your Bible. Let's read it right now. Now that that took us two minutes. You couldn't find two minutes for Jesus Christ during the week. Can you budget five minutes for your day? Can you? Can you? Okay. 2021, you can read more of the Bible than that, but I want you to do at least that. It's going to require budgeting our time. It's going to require budgeting our attention. If your car broke down today, would you go get it fixed? How quickly would you do that? 
would it usurp most else that you were doing? What if you had a toothache today? How, how important would dentistry be to you? Pretty important pretty quickly, right? How important is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Would you call it urgent? Would you if you knew you were going to die tomorrow? Together we will see him this year. How much is up to you? Straight through the scriptures, over and over again in the gospels, every single day, everyone in the congregation. Um, if you, by the way, are having difficulty with this, do an audio Bible. If you've got kids in the house, play an audio Bible in the morning as they're getting ready and having breakfast. Or have them read it on their own. This is a great chance for your kids to start doing their own Bible study each and every day. And let me say this, it's not about gathering more knowledge. We want to see Jesus for who he is, but it's not just more information about the man. There's a difference between information and relationship. Amen? We've got to make it personal. When you approach Jesus during this year, I want you to approach, and listen to me, this is important. I want you to approach a person, not a topic. This is a person, not a topic. Jesus is not just more information we're grabbing. When you engage with Jesus Christ in the Gospels this year, I want you to come at it, and I want you to come at him. Before you pray, begin with an invocation. Something like this. Jesus, I want to hear from you. And then let it sit for a moment. And then begin reading and letting him speak to you. It's another prayer I've been using a lot this week. It's a very old prayer. I've actually put it in your notes if you've got your paper with you. It's called the Jesus Prayer. The Orthodox Church has used this for a long time. It's a formulaic approach to Jesus. If you have anxiety problems, by the way, this is a great prayer. It goes like, goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you say it again, and you say it again. Wait, Ben, doesn't Jesus tell us not to use vain repetition? Yeah, vain repetition. Mean it every time you say it. Think about what's there. But, but use this as a way to introduce yourself to the passage. If you say that 40 times, it's very difficult to say it that many times where it doesn't start to speak to you. And you start dividing out that prayer, and it means something deep. Pray your way through the text. It's not just that you start your prayer or start your study with prayer, but pray your way through the text. Say things like this, Lord, I do not understand. What does this mean? Rabbi, I want to remember this teaching. Help me to hold on to the truth of it. Master, I'm having trouble believing this. Help my unbelief. Jesus, I want you to talk to me throughout the rest of the day. Help me to chew on this. You know what the Hebrew word for meditation is? It means to mutter or grumble. The idea is you're going through your day going, oh, blah, 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 blah. It, it would be great if at the front end of your day, and let me just say this, if you can position this at the front end of your day, I think it will mean a lot more to you. Sit down with a cup of coffee, because God will really bless it then. <laughs> Sit down with a cup of coffee and read through that text and just let the Lord speak to you and just say, Lord, take this. Help me to mutter about this today. I want to grumble about this. I want to wrestle with your word. Does your friendship resemble more of a Facebook fr friendship with Jesus, or does it resemble a real friendship? You know there's a difference, right? There's a difference between Facebook friends and real friends. We want to know Jesus, and that's going to involve some sincere interaction. How do you feel when I say this phrase, Jesus, our acquaintance? <laughs> does that make you comfortable? Jesus, our acquaintance. He and I are like Facebook friends. Let's be honest. This is where most Christians are with relation to Jesus. You know, a Facebook friend, it's so much different than a real friend. Uh, for those of you who are on Facebook or any other social media platform, you've all probably had that experience where you see somebody's face pop up and you're like, who is this person? How do I know them? I mean, it says that they're my friend, but I don't even know this person. I don't know this, who this person is. Which does your relationship with Jesus best exemplify? A conceptual relationship like what you've got on Facebook or a real relationship? A I would do anything for you, I would die for you type of relationship. Let's imagine you have met a random person at one stage of the game and this woman considers herself to be married to you. You met her, 
She considers herself to be married to you. She talks about you as if you're her, you're her spouse. She's had her license changed to your last name, and she has printed out her own marriage certificate where she signed your name on it as well as hers, and it's framed. It hangs on her wall. She's photoshopped pictures of the two of you together. She posts them on Facebook occasionally to let people know that you're having a great time. When you find this out, you approach her, and you ask her about what's, what's going on here. Her response is that she's devoted to you in her own way. She feels that the relationship is going pretty well. She likes what you, the two of you have going. Would that be bothersome? A little creepy? Is that the relationship you've been engaging in with Jesus Christ? I've been baptized. <laughs> we've, we've, got a, we've got a relationship. He and I have got a good thing going on. Do you spend any time together? I mean... Not really. Real friendships, real relationships have a history. Let me say that again. Real relationships have a history. Where have you gone with Jesus? Where have the two of you spent time together? Have you stayed up late at night with him uh, crying? What tragedies have you faced with him at your side? Where have you traveled together? What meals have you shared with one another? What difficult relationships have you navigated with him right there with you? Do you have a history with Jesus Christ? Or is your relationship with Jesus conceptual? I want to tell you the most terrifying words in Scripture. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. If you take nothing else out of the sermon today, I pray that you take this forward into this year. This should terrify anyone who calls himself a Christian. Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, pause there for just a second. Remember, when we have repetition in the original text, it is emphasis. This is not a person who says, Lord. This isn't somebody who just called Jesus Lord. This is somebody who really means it. Lord, Lord, I emphatically hold you to be my Savior. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, and that is the day of judgment, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Have you done any of those things? Would you feel safe with Christ if you had? Jesus is saying that person should not feel safe necessarily in their relationship if one thing is lacking. And I will declare to them, Jesus says, and these are the scariest words, underline this in your Bible, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. Can you imagine walking into eternity and saying, Jesus, Lord, and him looking at you and going, I don't know who you are. How much time have you invested to make sure he does know who you are? Could 2021 be the year that this all changes and flips for you? Or that this magnifies for you? If you're a critic at this stage of the game, you might be thinking, how close can we possibly be to Jesus? I mean, after all, he's there and I'm here. It's not like we're part of his original disciple retinue. Those guys got to walk with him. They probably heard him pass gas. They ate together. They went and, and bathed in rivers together. Those people laughed together and joked together. They had morning breath near one another. I mean, their, in, their intimate relationship with him was different than what I ever am going to have. Is that true? Well, I mean, it is different, right? Right? It's radically different. They were a little bit further away from Jesus than you will be. That's weird to think about. Uh, let me ask you, do you believe Jesus and what he said? Okay, well then that's going to be important. We think about people being close to us when they are in proximity to us, right? If somebody's near me, there are people who can lean up against me, doesn't matter. People who can touch me, people who can close talk to me, and it's okay. But what's it like when a stranger does that? When somebody gets up next to you and they touch your arm, and you're like, well, I don't know you. Or somebody gets up next to you and they start talking like this close to your face, and you're like, a little, little bit much. 
Proximity is a good indication of how close someone is to us. And we think, man, the disciples in Jesus' day, they had so much proximity, so much closeness with him. But look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you? Now, the follow-up question, do you believe Jesus? Is there a difference between the two? Yes, there is. Trusting Jesus enough to believe him makes a radical difference in the way you see life. Jesus answered the proximity question. If that is a concern of yours, I can't get close to Jesus because I'm not literally walking with him. Look at this text, John chapter 14, 18 through 21. Jesus says this to his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. Do you sometimes feel like an orphan, like God is so distant, he's out there somewhere, he's gone, but we're here by ourselves. Where's my dad? Jesus is not just talking about the second coming when he looks at this and he says, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to leave you. He seems to have more in mind. Look at verse 19. After a little while, the world is no longer going to see me, but you are going to see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Talk about a proximity issue. How close is Jesus? Uh, the Muslims have a phrase that I would like to usurp for this reason. They say God is as close as your jugular vein. Jesus is closer than your spirit is to you. He is in your innermost being. He is part of who you are. That's what he's portraying here in Scripture. Look at verse 21. The one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. And look at this last verse, and will reveal myself to him. Do you believe him? Do you believe that we can see Jesus this year? I only heard one yes. Do you believe that we can see Jesus this year? Yes. It's going to require that we seek him for the right reasons. I want you to be my master and Lord. It's going to require that we see him for who he truly is, that we're not projecting an image on him, but we let the scriptures speak to us and change us. We being remade in his image rather than us remaking him in our image. Amen? Are you willing to be challenged by the text this year? And lastly, that we come to know him. I don't want Jesus to just be an acquaintance. I want to build a history together. I do not want to hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. Can we make sure this year that we ensure a well-done, good and faithful servant? I anticipate that being the case. Will you commit a little bit of time to it this year? Do you think he will honor it if you do? All right, 2021, let's behold the man. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father and God, we praise you for your love for us, that you, even while we were enemies, died for us. But more than that, Father, that you... You call us to relationship. You say to us, come and see. Let this be the year we do that. Father, we are weak people, and I want to pray your help in getting this done. Lord, we pray that, uh, that this year your Holy Spirit would drive us to our knees, that you would drive us to the text, that you would help us to engage with you in a personal way so that by the time next year rolls around, we are well acquainted with our Lord and Savior. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray.